Hello. In my last lecture, we examined different dimensions of job and the job design. We will continue our discussion on job design and then see how to link job design, job evaluation to payment and compensation systems. And the basic learning goals of this lecture is the following. The end of this session, you should have learned and understood the factors affecting job design and also the payment systems in detail. When we use the word payment system, it means compensation system, wage and salary administration, things like that. But basically what we are trying to do is to examine how we can understand and analyze given jobs and then we looked at in the previous lecture, how to make it man machine system more effective and how to make jobs more challenging and also to create that motivational advantage. And also we link job through the job rotation, bring that kind of a developmental agenda for people to grow in the organization. Today, we will see the jobs in relation to the payment the salary and the compensation system. When we use these word payment system in general, wage and salary system in particular, people do refer wages to what people being paid on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, and salary as a as a as whatever is given once in a month. But these are notional views or the terms used in usage. But what is that? what is most important is to define is a system of compensation for the contribution of the people. We will also see what are the other benefit systems. So when we people talk about the salary and benefits, so what people get as a, uh, for their work is defined as salary, but also the other benefits which can include the fringe benefits like transportation, canteen, several work facilities, leave travel allowance, and many of such things are part of the benefit system. So from organization to organization, these would vary. However, all of the benefits depend upon the salary level of the employee, and the basic issue in payment system is to define an, uh, an equitable or the the everybody thinks that what they are getting is a kind of a fair deal from the or in the organization. So let's look at some of the, the basic factors affecting the job design itself. We have seen in our previous lecture there are various aspects to the job and the job enlargement, job enrichment, and the way one can work with the jobs through ergonomics and other methodologies. However, when you see typically there are three factors we need to look into, the organizational factors, the environmental factors, and the behavioral factors. And the organizational factors has to be understood in terms of characteristics of the task. Characteristics of the task is whether it is repetitive, whether the task involves a kind of a continuous working, typically in a, uh, bar, you know, <coughs> where the, the critical work involving maybe security or in terms of the boilers, some of these things have to be working all the 24 hours, what we will call it as a kind of a continuous work. It is not desirable that you stop some work or because of the, you know, the, because of the worker or the worker not being there. The second important characteristic is to see about the workflow itself. The workflow, if you see there are certain things are team-based work. Sometimes it is that you have to depend upon the other person to finish and then only you can take up the next step. The workflow sometimes is that it is highly time dependent. Some are highly process dependent. So the workflow factors is that 
the whether what is the nature of interdependency, whether other people depend on you and how much you depend on the other and then what is that kind of a synchronization with other tasks. So, all these are part of the workflow. And the third important dimension we have examined earlier is ergonomics. The ergonomics which involves the physiological effort, the psychological comfort and also the kind of dexterity, the strain and the stress and many of these factors which go into the task performance are understood and studied under this ergonomics. So, what is that the labor involved, what is that effort involved, whether it is standing or whether it is sitting or whether it strains one's legs or its eyes or it is uh, hand and things like that. And the and also the work practice. All these four one need to examine and in the lay once it, these things are well understood, it becomes easy to look into the various aspects of, uh, of job assessment and the job evaluation. When we see the job design, the job requires the assembly of a number of uh, tasks into a group of jobs. So, that means the task analysis or what people call as a job analysis becomes the, the fundamental thing. One can do this, the our understanding of this task and task characterization through observation. One can sit and observe. Sometimes it is talking to the worker will give you what are the complexities of the job. That means interviewing uh, the worker and the operator. Sometimes one need to see the, the uh, one need to supplement this observation and the interviewing also with the expert views of how the tasks are being done and what are the changes uh, one can introduce. It is also possible to see how technology can be introduced so that certain tasks, a repetitive tasks could be helped through better automation. In other words, one need to understand the nature of task, the sequences and the kind of uh, complexity. Whatever may be the model one can use, the characteristics of the task involves the basically the three elements. So, the internal structure of each task we will see a planning that means what tools, what resources, what kind of effort is required to pool all the required resources. So, this is uh, all part of the planning. Second is executing the time, the quality, the application of the skill, application of the knowledge, the kind of expertise which is required which comes around knowledge with experience and also controlling, controlling the cost, controlling the fineness, controlling the speed, so many of these aspects. So, the planning, executing and controlling are the basic three elements of any task and that is the internal structure. When we looked at the workflow, it is strongly influenced by the nature of the products or services. It could be in hotel industry or it could be in a manufacturing or it could be a repair shop. So, many of these things will once somebody observes this will help you to understand what is the kind of a workflow. So, what is that things to be or what are the things to be done first, what are the things to be done next and the sequence is critical or the sequence is flexible. So, then you have to see the balance between the jobs, then you know the, if the work is done efficiently. So, what are these efficient ways of working has to be defined, has to be understood. And the sequencing of the job, criticality of some of the jobs for the smooth workflow has to be sometimes narrated so that it can be used to arrange the jobs for the purpose of salary or payment system. The other we have already discussed in detail is the ergonomics concerned with designing and shaping jobs to fit the physical ability and characteristics of the individual. See, the ergonomics does not change the nature of the job itself. However, 
a good, well understood ergonomics of the situation can help design of better jobs, which we have seen earlier. But however, the what are the physical conditions? What are the noise level? What is the, the heat and stress one has to go through in performing the task? Or it is the kind of repetitiveness of the task. Many of these things will help to control ergonomically to see what should be the work rest freedom. What should be the the stretch of any particular activity. If some jobs, particularly let's say this BPO, business process outsourcing kind of a company, where people use the most of the time digitization kind of a work, so it is eye hand coordination, so there may be fatigue of the fingers, so there may be small breaks are provided for that. Similarly, the eyes, which may get strained because they are continuously watching the monitor. So it's one way of doing, you know, thinking about it ergonomically is to provide that kind of a required break and break that kind of a monotony and suggest some physical activities as well. So the organizations are trying to see the jobs and the kind of breaks, what it should be given so that people can come back to its original and the fatigue or the stress will not result in poor performance or affecting the health of the employees. So the ergonomic consideration is another important dimension in understanding and ranking the jobs. Then we also talk about the work practices. So the ways of performing the work. So which is basically what we have seen determined by the time and motion studies. So various tasks, various activities, what are the time taken to do all the things, and then also the kind of sequences which is involved, and the eye hand coordination, so many of these things. So these methods also will arise from both the traditional of or the collective wishes of the employees. No doubt, set of things are the stated in the workbooks but people also develop what is known as a customary work practices. Customary work practices is what people adopt and they think that is the best way of uh, doing things. We have seen employees using both the hands for doing certain tasks. Sometimes they group the activities in such a way that they each one of them do mostly some of the repetitive kind of a thing or part of the work. Sometimes they distribute the task in such a way where collectively they try and do that. So it is not only the ideal work practices, but one should also observe the customary work practices, how people have made some changes and what people are comfortable with. So understanding work practices again will help to see the kind of physical, the intellectual and other efforts required to perform the given job. Then we also talked about this environmental factors, the employee ability and availability. So the efficiency consideration must be balanced against the abilities and availability of the people. Like sometimes certain tasks are performed by the trainee. Sometimes it is performed by the very skilled employee. Sometimes it is performed by the master craftsman. So then if you see Sometimes it is a, could be a demonstration of the quality, but not getting that same consistency over a period of time. I think that's what an expert would do. But then there are people who anxious they would do, but with a lot of errors. So we need to see what, is the, what are their abilities and how do they do the task. So jobs are, are have to be designed and uh, designated from very very clearly a simple and also what we should do is in terms of the required whether little training or not. So the environmental factors we should also see in terms of the heat, noise and, and such factors which also influence the employee performance. One should also see in terms of the social and cultural expectations. So failure to consider the social expectations also can create dissatisfaction. 
particularly how many hours one need to work and the kind of low motivation could be there in, uh, in certain organizations. And there are some jobs which people don't like it at all called as hard to fill job openings and also a low quality of work life. That means where people have to work through, throughout the night and they're not able to get that kind of a required quality daytime. So one also need to see what people like and people hate and people don't want to. So the social and cultural expectations. In some uh, banks, people don't like to handle the big uh, cash because the cash is seen is always a kind of a risk prone kind of a thing. So the people have to see this as a task where they can feel more comfortable. So what are those cultural expectations? What people call as easy jobs or tough jobs or where the jobs which people psychologically define it as cushy jobs, things like that. So the social and cultural expectations in an organization also defines the strata, the, the acceptability of the persons doing such tasks and these things alone uh, are not the a beginning and the end, but it is important to see what are those expectations and the perceptions in the given context. Behavioral elements are the other dimension. The behavioral uh, factors have to do with the human needs and the necessity to satisfy them, as we all know. So the, what is important is, inspired by the higher level needs, to find the jobs as challenging and satisfying. So it is important to see whether what is the perceptions of the people and those perceptions generate the required behaviors or not. In one of the companies, they, they talked to the security guard. Security guard's job was taken it very, very easily, but then they briefed them, look, you are the first person to be seen by anyone visiting the organization. And so, you, whatever the impression you give, that has a lot of impact on the, on the visitors. So when such briefings was given, the individual started seeing the same task in a different way. So coming with a good uniform, polishing the shoe, how to stand and how to salute, all these things became very, very relevant. So the question is, what are the behavioral elements going into the task, the jobs? But if people feel that their jobs are irrelevant, their jobs are not core to the organization, or their jobs are outliers and peripheral, then to that extent, there will be lack of involvement, lack of contribution, as well as that people take the jobs as routine and may not be proactive. So it is extremely important to see how the behaviors in the organization have treated that particular job and what is the kind of a perception of the self who is going to occupy those positions or the job and also what is the perception of others in the organization to see uh, the job as desirable or undesirable or difficult, or routine or core or otherwise has to be analyzed. I think these things will give a kind of a picture of the job. The, the other way one would like to see the job could be compared with how it is perceived, how it is seen as core in other organizations. So a comparison made with other jobs available in other organizations. I think that's one way of valuing the job, another way of seeing the how the job is valued by the others, not only in the organization, but also outside the organization. So the external comparisons become very relevant, particularly when we are going to decide about the salary levels and the compensation plan. So the salary surveys are regularly performed, performed by either independent people or independent journals. Sometimes it is the consultants or sometimes it is the engineering professional bodies or the institute. And then, you know, the, so they all provide some kind of a raw data to start with. To start with, how should it be internally? the job is valued in, we can also see how other organizations 
For example, we have seen reports coming from the different institutes of management and they start talking about this is the placement salary and uh, our students got this as the minimum. So when they talk about as uh, the minimum salary offers and what they have got this year, so the campus gets rated around those things. And similarly, the organizations giving the salaries. So in all ways, this kind of a salary survey or salary comparison has been used as a kind of a benchmark to understand the importance of a particular skill set, particular job, and helps in defining what is to be given. But job evaluation, we will examine it later on, it also has been very extensively used to come with a kind of a payment structure. So for the payment system to be fair, the relative value of each job should be known. So the job evaluation has been defined as the process of determining the relative worth of the job for salary purposes. So the key word is the relative worth of the job. So the relative worth of the job can be obtained through different methods, through different uh, procedures. But what is important is to adopt a simplest of the procedure which makes sense within the organization. We will discuss the different methods of uh, job evaluation, but one also has to see all this job evaluation is done because the, to look at the job and look at the relative worth of the job for the purpose of remuneration, for the purpose of payment. We know that we are discussing these words, payment systems, wage and salary systems, wage and salary administration, or it is the compensation system or the remuneration. So all these things mean uh, the same and similar things. It is only the details could vary from one context to the other, but it all means the same. So the package of uh, benefits that an employee gains from his or her job can be put as the kind of a remuneration or the compensation. So when, you, when we talk about the wage and salary administration, essentially the aim of this particular system is to define the way in which the employees of the organization will be remunerated, how, uh, how they will be compensated. So in other words, what wages and salary they need to get. So the question is the definition of this and how this can be done what kind of procedures, what kind of processes can be adopted. The, the remuneration, if you see, it should be in proportion to the contribution of the organizational success. It cannot be independent of that. So if it is independent of that, that means irrespective of whether the organization is making profit or loss, or whether it is growing or otherwise, if the remuneration is is you know is not understood and not linked to these aspects can become a burden can become a problem so it is extremely desirable that to match the success of the organization as to the to the remuneration so in other words the growth in salary has to be in proportion to so if if the organization is growing but if they are not transferred to the individual, then it affects seriously the motivation of the employee, the attitudes of the employee. Then people find it difficult to work in the organization, but it develops a kind of a helplessness. It does not contribute to the motivation and the involvement of the employee. So that is where the remuneration has to be in proportion to the contribution of the organizational success. But if the organization has done pretty well, but the, if it is not shared, we saw it is going to contribute to the demotivation. But if organization is not performing, but the individual gets paid, the individual gets paid whether they work or they don't work, but in the long run, it is going to kill the organizational health, organizational success. So it is extremely important to manage these two together so that they, they, they give the required benefit.
So it does not normally consist only of pay and the amount of other benefits. It also includes, uh, depends upon the nature of the job in question. So one need to see the pay and the benefits or the salary and the benefits. And usually when you look at the benefits, people call it as fringe benefits. So the additional benefits, so the fringe benefit normally might add up to anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of the basic wage. In some situations, it can go beyond 70 to 80 percent of the, the basic wages. So the question is that what are these benefits? How much of these benefits to be to be made available to the employees. Sometimes the fringe benefits are also taken as a part of the tax planning. However, we will assume that all the benefits are taxable. All the benefits have to be given out by the organizational profits. And so the question is, what should be the kind of a proportion? The ideal is that it meets all the requirements of the employee. So the question of this is the, 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 the people try and link the payment systems to the standard of living. So this forms the important contribution that means the standard of living. The standard of living itself could, could be a matter of discussion and debate. So what should be the minimum wage? What should be the sufficient wage? What should be that kind of a comfortable wage which meets the standard of living? So one view has been standard of living is that the payment which is adjusted to the, the inflation rates or the what that employee can buy or what people also link it to the cost of living index. So the cost of living index is, is will always help you to look at the inflation and then you are making some adjustments to that. But however, the standard of living could mean at the minimum level is it takes care of the basic necessities of the employee for food, shelter, and probably a minimum education for the children, and then uh, comfort of the house. So, but one can also define the standard of living at the as one can see that to include many more things. So, it could be a housing, could be a car, it could be an education and a in some of the best of the schools for the children. And uh, so one can keep on adding to this list. So the question of what should be the minimum, what should be the sufficient thing has been a kind of a debate. And more so in India about the what should be the kind of a thing. And we see a wide variety of, uh, of, of practices in the organization. But the, the question is that unless you maintain and support the employee standard of living, you will not get the charged, motivated, and contributing employees in the long run. The next important thing is to you know, see some of the examples of the benefits. It could be many benefits one can get in an organization. It is the productivity link bonus which could be paid quarterly, that is once in, uh, once in three months, as well as it could be biannual, could be maybe once in six months or annually, the once in a year. So the productivity link bonus is also called as the ex gratia. Then the, the payment system can also include the personal insurance, personal insurance for the risk involved in travel, risk involved uh, within the organization and outside the organization for the self, for the spouse, and for the members of the organization. So apart from the personal insurance against accident and uh, things like that, the health cover also could be for the sickness. So the health insurance is going to come in another way. So the, the benefits can also include the contribution or a complete coverage about the, about the health. The payment and benefit systems can also include the paid holidays and entitlements. That means, you know, annually you get some time to visit your home, hometown or if you are coming from another country to visit your country. 
or it is the kind of a paid holiday you take on vacation. Then the subsidize the social club, that is contribution to the membership of various clubs, or company gas, or the company patrol, then uh, to crash facilities. Crash is, is where the employee uh, can bring their kids with the age group of maybe six months to six months to three years or three and a half years. And then they have a facility in the company premises to take care of them. Sometimes it is also demanded under the Factories Act that where it is compulsory to provide a crash if you have a minimum number of uh, lady employees. So the question is that these are all the kind of benefits. Some are seen as very direct benefits, some are indirect benefits. Most of the time when we are talking about compensation payment systems, we are bothered about those direct benefits. Then one can also get the employee the stock options in terms of the shares. There is a preferential you know, quota for the employees. Then the pension. The pension is also called as a kind of a deferred wages. Then the festival advances and the festival gifts or Christmas hampers. Then also the book allowances, the bank sign allowances and things like that. So if somebody attempts to make a list of these things, it could be exhaustive. Different nomenclature, different levels of contribution from one organization to the other. So the question is, all these things has to be linked A, either to the job and the job level of the job holder or the kind of contribution when the job is making to the overall health of the organization and productivity of the organization or the way the organization perceives the job and the way it would like to share some of the success of the organization. But today, there are many more benefits are talked about apart from kind of a cash allowances, but then there are company picnics, the company outings with, uh, along with the family and things like that. So when we are talking about this, the organization will have its own policy concerning the allocation of such benefits. So some are very liberal, some are very strict, some are very conservative. So that you could also see the rules of the game also could vary from one organization to the other. So in most cases, the organization assigns a monetary value to each element of the remuneration package. That means we try and use that a total total of this as a kind of a, as a totality, as a kind of a cost to the company. So the CTC is another concept where we include every details, everything what is given to the employees, both directly as well as indirectly, but you are able to put, you know, assign a kind of a clear monetary value. So the question of this, the, what should be the calculation of the wage? So the wage is calculated by subtracting the value of other benefits from the monetary value assigned to the job. So that means the different individuals may rate the value of the benefits differently. Sometimes you may get it, sometimes you may, you may don't want, you know, you don't want to have such benefits. Some are seen as a kind of a deferred benefit. Some are seen as a kind of a notional benefit. For example, maternity leave. So somebody may not enjoy that at all. The, so for the question is if somebody is not married and somebody is uh, not going to get that kind of a benefit, may would like to have uh, something else in the organization. So the question of that, how this uh, benefits to be given and how the benefits are valued, what is to be calculated. However, the individuals do perceive these differences. A cost to the company, then the other is what is known as a, the gross salary, and the third one is kind of what people call it as the take-home pay. Take-home pay is the final the money what one has after deducting for all the statutory payments and other the deductions that are what is called as the authorized deduction. So these things have, uh, have influence on what should be the, the, the tot total salary. The second is in terms of the gross salary. Gross salary includes all the direct things. 
but may not include some of the indirect things which can be which part of the the canteen which can be part of the subsidized food things like that but when we use the ctc all the money which is spent for the employee things are included and sometimes it is divided by the number of employees to indicate what would be the kind of a cost to the company for employee or for that particular person so the the question is there are two extreme views that might be taken with regard to a payment system one everyone receives the same wage you know it's it's uh, it's good to talk like this and uh, it is desirable that everybody gets the same thing and with no differential at all so the ideological system has been tried but has seems to have never seems to survive so that means it is not been found to be very practical but it is good that every individual has a right to everything and then they should get the same things across i think it is nice but has not been uh, followed so question is that you know the people have found such systems are soon undermined by the inevitable movement of uh, personnel so the senior people leave the organization to earn more elsewhere and the and also if you see the resultant skill imbalance ruins the organization because there is no incentive to do more or to to become better employee and then so the salary payment system is seen as an important motivational uh, tool so unless this is deployed in a proper way it may not contribute towards attracting the great talents as well as retaining the talent and making the talent to do more so the, that's where one should see that the second argument is everyone should receive remuneration in proportion to their contribution to the organization purpose i think this proposal has been widely accepted because then you are talking about what is their contribution or what is this jobs contribution i think this is much more acceptable than thinking about or making sure that everyone gets the same thing so that's where the idea of how to recognize these different contribution and the relevant things so when we are talking about the central question is how to rate the job within the organization one is to rate the job and then to see what that uh, contribution of that particular individual but when we are talking about the relative worth of the job we are not bothered about the individual but all of our focus is on the job itself and irrespective of who is going to occupy the job and what that particular individual may or may not do but we are discussing about the scope of the job and then understanding the job and the job performance situation so this may be achieved in the following three ways we have talked about this external comparison and then the next one is the job evaluation and different methods of job evaluation and the third one is the job assessment each of these things may overlap a little bit but each of them will help identifying and arranging the relative worth of the job external comparison is made with other jobs available in the organization then it is also if you see that when you would like to compensate a skilled employee so once you want to determine what should be paid for the skilled employee your effort is to find out what other similar organizations in the same region or in other regions are paying so it could be a kind of a comparison with a neighboring organization may or may not be in the same field or all the organizations in the similar industry so a regional survey or industry level survey is what is conducted to bring that kind of a comparison so once you know that what is being paid by the other company then the choice has to be made in relation to that whether you would like to lead this or whether you would like to be the second in the market 
or the weather just you would like to be a follower. So that means you are going to attract at what level. So the, that's where it helps to make your payment system as competitive as possible. So it is another important problem in this is it is difficult than it seems since the companies are reluctant to disclose their own payment systems usually. Unless you give out, unless you provide your rationale, unless you explain how you are handling that the other organization also may not be too willing to come and share. So that is where what is important is for the external comparison is to have a kind of a compensation clubs. Compensation clubs are headed by the people who are in charge of human resource management and more particularly those of them who are who are going to decide on the compensation system to meet regularly and share the kind of internal changes, the kind of external pressures and the kind of salary system what they are maintaining so that each one can define what would be the best for their organization. And also sharing of this information can also lead to establishing some of the gro ground rules when they have to take employees from other neighboring company or other competitors. So sharing helps in terms of bringing some kind of a stability in the markets where the, the labor market situations are very tight or where the supply is not enough. That time compensation clubs will help for moderation. External comparisons are, are most useful because then you can keep your salary systems, payment system as competitively as possible. But salary surveys are regularly performed by sometimes as I said that independent, sometimes journals, independent consultants or some of the engineering professionals. So then it definitely provides the raw data but having raw data alone won't help because based on the raw data one need to see where is the wage curve standing and then based on the wage curve you have to see whether you would like to position your job at the same level, uh, one above, so that you give a little more money than what others are paying, so that you can attract, and whether you also have to see at what level you want to make it more competitive, at the entry level or at the level where people are experienced in the industry. So if the attraction is a difficult issue at the, at the beginning, then you would make it, that is at the entry level, then there you make it very, very competitive. That means you pay 15%, 20%, 40% more than the others. And this can, this kind of a strategy can also lead to a kind of a, what people call it as a kind of a rat race, where people compete with each other to attract the same labor pool. But if that's not the condition, then with the labor condition, labor market supply is much more comfortable means you can still keep it competitive, but not the differential need not be so high where the where you, the organization need not spend uh, mu you know, much money to create that kind of a differential. So what the question is, the salary surveys are an important part of the, the payment system. Another important thing is the job evaluation. See, what we are talking about is for a payment system to be fair, the relative value of each job must be known. So that means we should be able to arrange the job in a hierarchical manner. So that means we need to create this a kind of a fair and equitable system within the organization can be achieved through different methods. And one of the key methods is to go through a job evaluation procedure. So a list of jobs within the organization has to be compiled. So then, you know, we have to put it in such a way it reflects the importance of the company places on each one. So how this could be done, one can think of various methods. The methods of job evaluation are briefly the ranking method, the grading method, the factor comparison method, and also the point rating method. In the ranking method, what is done is to pool all the existing designations. All the existing designations, like 
the managers, the supervisors, and maybe the operators. So then in the ranking method, the first is you put all the managers on the top, supervisors to the middle, then the operators. Then within the operators, there are various uh, designations are possible. So various designations again arrange in relation to the skilled, semi-skilled, and the unskilled. And within the unskilled, again, many designations can be put into some one above and one below. I think that's how the ranking method is. The first step is to pool all the existing designations. First, second is to rank in a broad band of from highest to the lowest. And within each of these bands, again, you have to rearrange these designations so that it gives that kind of a relative uh, ranking. So at times what happens is the existing designations do come in the way without understanding the nature and complexity of the job. The One of the examples given is would you rank a gas cutter as higher versus a grass cutter? So both of them are doing the same cutting job. So the gas cutter is there in the shop floor and the grass cutter is there in the taking care of the estates of the company. So which should be put as better? I think this is only a, an example of how existing designations can come in the way. So the ranking method suffers from that kind of a that kind of an issue. But it is very simple to apply. But at times it can create complications because the existing designations may not mean much in terms of differences in responsibility, in terms of the challenge, things like that. The next method is the grading method. In the grading method, what is done is the first, all the salary grades with a beginning and an increment rate of something and the, you know, the, and the end of the particular scale, the salary scale is also considered as grade. So the number of salary scales in the organization is decided. So it could be starting from that minimum salary you're going to pay 2,000 rupees a grade could be typically a you know, 2,050, then 2,500, 60, 3,000. So if this is what would mean, a, in a grading method, first you define a kind of a salary scale. And then different salary scales are put together from the lowest to the highest with a different increments rate, with a different eligibility period. And in a grading method, one issue is that you can also have a grade which is non-overlapping or it also could be the overlapping. So that means, going back to the previous example, so we may decide that within the managers, there will be three grades, and within the supervisors, there will be three grades, and with respect to the operators, there will be seven grades. So that means you define 7 plus 3 plus 3, 15 grades in the organization. And then you take different designations and then you will place where it should be. So some could be grade 1 of the supervisory position, grade 2 of the supervisory position or grade 3. The advantage of this grading method is you can freeze how many layers you will have in the organization and how much depending on the kind of a responsibility and the complexity of the details, you can also place them in different grades. But one can always get into an argument is that a particular designation should be in the higher grade or it should be in the lower grade. And when such kind of a conflict comes, it is difficult to resolve. However, grading method is one of the most simplest of the methods organizations have employed and it is good to use it in the, in the administration and it is also very, very practical. But ranking and grading methods have some of its own inherent difficulties, so we move on to the factor comparison method. In a factor comparison method, usually a set of comparable jobs are picked and a set of factors, typically seven or nine factors, which are applicable to the, those jobs are identified. That means typically the factor could include the education, the training, the, you know, the working conditions, 
the responsibility for people, the responsibility for things. So one of the these are these are the factors can be put together, and then they are put in a scale of one to five. <coughs> so each of the factors for a particular job is rated. So then the seven factors, if you consider a set of comparable jobs, then can be rated from seven to thirty-five. So seven to thirty-five will be the kind of a factor rating. And within that factor rating, you can always work through that how much should be kind of a factor per factor the salary could be. So when you think of the, the you know each factor, you know multiply it by into about say 200 rupees, then the lowest would be that about 1,400 rupees, and then the highest would be into 35 into 200. So the question is that the what should be the highest salary and what should the lowest salary gets defined, and then in the based on the factor rating one can do this. But in a factor rating, there could be you know the idea is that you can always disagree on some of the factor ratings, and then make some changes whatever is required. People think it is very useful when you have a strong unions, strong trade unions, and you have to negotiate with them. so that's where the factor comparison gives the basis for negotiation than compared to the ranking and a grading method where you are treating the job as a whole and then sometimes it is very difficult to negotiate if there are some disagreement the point rating method is the improvement of the factor comparison method because in the factor comparison method we give the same weightage to all the considered factors but in the point rating method different weights can be assigned to different factors and and then you can decide for example education could be about 80 points then the 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 training could be 40 points and so 120 points can be assigned to the education and training so like that for consider different factors you can identify different weights and then the jobs are compared and a minimum and a maximum is defined for particular point rating and that becomes the basis for defining the salary scale as well as becomes a point for negotiation so the question is this and the jobs are in order it follows that the remuneration should also be in order and the and a glance down the column of salaries will easily reveal any anomalies so one can always check whether some lower point rating the rated jobs are getting little lower or higher the other one is in terms of the job assessment a comparison is often made of the content of all jobs and its responsibilities within the company against the people who fill the post so that means who are likely to come and take up that kind of a position so this is done to ensure that there are no inconsistencies within the organization particularly people come with the different levels of qualification and making sure that that kind of a fairness and an equity is maintained so people of certain standard it means you know for example the the education in with which they come from maybe from iits maybe from local engineering colleges or from a, a reputed institution so one would like to see and maintain some kind of an expectation around these things so it should have a similar level of uh, competence and then the corresponding the kind of a remuneration the 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 issue is really that nothing is more likely to cause trouble than having two people doing the same work and receiving differential salaries so these kinds of a comparisons do bring in the dissatisfaction amongst the job applicants so a similar profile of the employee and uh, so when you analyze then make sure that you get the they get a fair you know, similar one to ensure that employee is fairly rewarded so then one can also get into the personal assessments we have seen the performance appraisal system can be supported to make sure that their qualification and skills are given a kind of a ranking relative to the others so uh, based on the such assessments some tweaking also could be done
So the more skilled and more qualified the employee is, then the more the person has to get. I think that is the, that's the principle. So very clearly, you know, one can get into this. The commonly used system uh, for choosing this final numerical value for any salary or a compensation, we can follow any of the, the system which we talked about earlier, the job evaluation method, the comparison methods, or also the job assessment methods. But finally, you have to get into a kind of a graded system. Please do not confuse with the grading method what we talked around the job evaluation system. One can also think of a free position system. And if you see this, the, there is a considerable difference in the job description of people between the grade and each point of salary is assigned. Everyone in the organization has a salary somewhere in the chart, so which is linked to the wage curve. And that becomes very easy to analyze and understand. So in the graded system, the jobs are divided. So within the each grade, then there are various points at each level responds to a level in the kind of a seniority. So that means very clearly differentiated between the compensation and the payment system. And then, you know, one can also get into that. So one can make changes or tweak these things on an annual basis. Though, so every time you can some kind of a one, it could be negotiated or you can make sure that the there are such salary adjustments are made so that a senior or a person who is contributing or person who is more qualified. So some of these things are not really disturbed within the organizational system. One can also make some changes and tweak it through the promotion system. So moving from one level to the other or moving from one grade to the other so that whenever there are issues of this nature can be corrected. But in a free position system, using the free positions, individuals are permitted to take on any salary level in the organization without caring for their qualification, experience or anything. It is fine. It is advantageous to the organization. But people are paid differently. But the disadvantage is that employees may come to a conclusion that the organization is paying in an ad hoc manner and the least it can uh, get away with. So that means, you know, people are not too happy with that kind of a thing. So the more secret approach one leads to, the question is the policy of the organization. So people start getting into the speculation and then may be perceived as not very fair, not open. So that is where the idea of that making sure that compensation and payment systems are meeting the expected practices. So the system does not allow flexibility and provided employees feel that it is indeed the greater contributors who receive the greatest uh, rewards. So I think that's where the, you know, the system makes extreme demand on the appraisal system. If it is used in assessing performances and therefore increase the salary. So a good salary and a wage system and a good appraisal system will always help the organization. So we have seen various factors affecting the job design and the payment system in detail and then what we will do in the next uh, session, we will move on to another important topic is the concept and definition of organization development, the characteristics of ODI and the historical development of this field.